We are so glad to have you, whether you are here for the first time. Uh, this is our 60th consecutive forum. So some of you have your regular attendance pins and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. You know that uh, we come together to talk about important issues for Kentucky's kids every Wednesday. Uh, this week and next week, we're talking about uh, one of the most important issues, which is the K-12 system and Kentucky's children. Uh, next week, as a, as a prelude, we're going to have uh, representatives from the uh, Superintendent Association, the Teachers Association, and parents on here. So they're going to watch today's discussion, bring their own perspectives, and that's going to be sort of an on-the-ground perspective. But today, we have uh, the two folks who, at least in my perception, uh, are driving public schools in Kentucky. Commissioner Jason Glass and Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman. Uh, I always try to be really upfront on these forums, and I usually say to our guests, we're going to have some disagreements and a little contentiousness, or we're going to just have a talk. I just need to say in transparency to uh, all of you who are watching, uh, I am so happy to have two folks whom I respect so greatly. Uh, I was telling the commissioner uh, beforehand, uh, it's been a long time since Kentucky has had a commissioner who was kid-centric. Uh, we have a commissioner who is kid-centric, and, and Dr. Glass, I appreciate your posture on that more than you can know. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you, you already know, I always tell you I'm president of the Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline <laughs> Coleman fan club. I've been reelected twice. And so, <laughs> I'm still there. So we're really, really happy to have both of you. And again, thanks so much uh, for all of you who are viewing this. So uh, I have taken the challenge that every time uh, I talk with the Lieutenant Governor, I open with a quote from Pat Summit. Uh, some of you will not know who that is, but uh, Pat Summit was the legendary women's coach of the Lady Balls. But really, in later in life, became something of a, of a leadership guru. And so uh, I think the lieutenant governor even went to a Pat Summit basketball camp, if I remember correctly. And so I wanted to make sure that, that we frame the discussion with Pat Summit wisdom. And I love, love this quote. The willingness to experiment with change may be the most essential ingredient to success at anything. I'm going to read that one more time. The, the willingness to experiment with change may be the most essential ingredient to success at anything. So, you know, uh, Lieutenant Governor, what I love about the perspective you bring to schools is you're like this highfalutin official now, but, <laughs> but, but three years ago in July, if I'm not wrong, you were figuring out cafeteria schedules mm -hmm. and bus duty supervision. Yes which I think is so important to know that you have that pragmatic lens. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm really curious because today's conversation, and I say this to our, our visitors on the forum, we're not going to talk about CDC guidelines uh, a whole lot because those will probably change tomorrow. Uh, we're really going to focus on what happens inside the school building and outside the school building for kids. So I guess I'm just curious. You're you're an assistant principal. Uh, you know what kids have gone through. Mm -hmm. You know the challenges that the teachers and administrators are facing. Uh, what's that Pat Summit quote say to you? What what do you what what do you hope schools experiment with to ensure kids have success? That's a great, I mean. It's a great quote, but obviously I, I fall at the feet of, of Pat Summit on, on most things, and I am a huge fan of her, so thank you for starting with the Pat Summit quote. But, um, you know, when she talks about experimenting, uh, you, you know, we're also talking about the most successful, um, one of the most successful basketball coaches, forget women's basketball coaches, basketball coaches in the, in the history of the game. And her, her um, focus on that word experiment, to me, uh, reminds us that sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to, right? Or the way that you think mm -hmm. that they should. And so in that experiment, we find resilience. And we know our kids are far more resilient than, than we are <laughs> many times. Uh, but I think it's the example, and that's part of the, the you know, influence relationship of leadership, right? Is 
when things don't work out the way you want them to, or when things don't go the way you thought they might, how do you react to it, right? When that experiment fails, kids are watching to see how you respond, how you react, and how you choose to to pivot and lead. And so I would I would lean towards resilience in that in that quote, but I would also lean towards that um, leadership by example. Uh, our kids have faced unprecedented times, just like all of, all of the rest of us have. Many of them have been robbed of experiences in their childhood that maybe we took for granted. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. We have to pause and acknowledge that and, and uh, understand that there will be um, repercussions and there will be a change in, in norms as we know them. But how we choose to lead our way out of this and how we choose to um, be be the example that we need them to be and that that's parents and school leaders i think um is is going to be critical uh, a very very critical component to our success moving forward commissioner one of the things that animates uh, the way you're leading kde is is you invite innovation and imagination rather than conformity and compliance so play with that concept of experimentation uh, channel your own Pat Summit uh, and give us some <laughs> reflections on what you hope for your own kids and for all of Kentucky's kids. Right. Well, and thank you for hosting this and thanks for all that you do and what KYA does to support uh, kids in our state. So it's a tremendous organization. I'm glad to be part of this with, the, with you and the Lieutenant Governor. Um, I, uh, one of the things that came to mind when you were reading that quote uh, from, from Pat Summit uh, to follow on it is, uh, the old adage that uh, necessity is the mother of invention, mm -hmm. uh, and we have just experienced uh, a year where we've had to do a lot of things very differently. Uh, one of the things that we did at KDE and that I've done with my student advisory council is ask them about their experiences over this past year uh, through a lens of what are some things that they would like to have hospiced. Um, in other mm -hmm. words, this needs to have a, a, a gradual but intentional end to it. Um, what are the things and what are some things that they want to amplify uh, that were uh, emerged from this experience that they want to lift up that they think, they think were uh, good experiences. Um, so uh, coming out of that, some of the things that the students have told us that they want amplified, they really appreciated uh, the flexibility that came with the hybrid and in some cases virtual learning, and that's something that they wanted to hang on to. Uh, so while they did miss the in-person learning and the times that that was disrupted, and they acknowledged that that was really important, they also said that there are things uh, that they can learn outside of the traditional classroom, outside of school. Uh, there are things that they can learn on their own in terms of student directed uh, experiences or projects. There's things that they can learn asynchronously so they don't all have to be together learning the same thing at the same time. And they hope that those elements would continue. That flexibility and that greater sort of student directed uh, approach would, would be something that would continue. Uh, another element that arose um, that the students lifted up was that it was uh, from their perspective, uh, much more organized in terms of what was being asked of them and where resources would be made available. And I think that's a, a product of uh, necessity. Uh, our teachers had to think about how can we make content available? How can we make really clear what uh, assignments are, are and put all that together in a unified system where kids can go and clear, clearly find that and then respond. Uh, so our students said that was enormously helpful. And if you think about the experience of, uh, say, a high school student, where you're going from a different task and content area to a different task and content area every 50 minutes. That is a brutal uh, schedule for any person uh, to have to survive. And so they really appreciated the organization uh, that came with it. And the final thing I think that our students uh, lifted up is that they recognized uh, the importance and how, how technology could change what was possible in terms of how they learned, how they accessed information. So we, we we learned a lot about what we could do with technology and sort of broke through that question of, are we going to be technology rich? Are we going to be a one-to-one -one district or state or school? Yes, is the answer to that now. But they also uh, recognize the uh, limitations of technology. Uh, while there are things that, that it does that we couldn't do in a purely analog world, there's still this importance of human relationship. And that's one of the things that they wanted us. They said, we need to make sure we hang on to that as we emerge from uh, this experience we've had this past year. Yeah. Great. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I wish we as a state could experience, could experiment with, 
is returning to a day when K-12 was a common ground, common sense, and common agreement arena. Uh, I'm old and decrepit, so I remember when the care started and Democrats and Republicans and urban and rural folks came together for that vision. Uh, you know, now I hear uh, toxicity, polarization, uh, whether it is school choice or critical race theory or a myriad of other issues. And so uh, I guess I'm curious, uh, Commissioner, because you have been in places other than Kentucky. Uh, and my sense is that this bifurcation on K-12 uh, is really a national dog whistle. Uh, I'm curious if you have hopes and ideas on how we can return to the day where we're all focused on good things for kids in schoolhouses. Well, I hold out hope for that. Uh, we're, we know that we're running into headwinds uh, for that because the uh, uh, strategies that are being employed in national, state, and local politics are to activate the very most extreme parts of all bases. Um, and that's done by uh, generating anger. And sometimes that's, that's uh, amplifying uh, isolated cases, or in some cases it, it is through the amplification of misinformation. Um, to try and activate uh, e extreme views and make sure that they turn out in the next election. So this is all about um, power and activation of, of um, uh, the base parts of, of both parties. Um, I, I do hold out hope that we uh, can and we should um, have education rise above that political fray because regardless of what political stripes you have, if you're a Republican, Democrat, or, or somewhere in between or somewhere outside of that, we all love our kids. We all want them to be successful. And uh, I've had conversations with Republican groups, Democratic groups, and all sorts of groups. And when I ask them, what are their aspirations for their children? What are the experiences they would like to have their children have in school and in life? It's all the same things. They want their children to be cared for. They want them to be prepared. They want them to have good relationships with their teachers and their, and their uh, uh, peers. They want them to have great experiences in their communities. They want them to be able to pursue their dreams. And then they want them to graduate and be citizens and be uh, productive um, parts of society and have good jobs and have happy lives and pursue the American dreams. That transcends party. Um, so in, in our conversations in Kentucky about the future of education, we've taken the radical approach of that it's not a political question. Uh, it's a question around what are the aspirations of Kentuckians and listening to those from that, hearing from Kentuckians, regardless of where they, where they are, or what their um, partisan stripes are, um, listening to those aspirations and then building a future plan based on that is the only way uh, that we can hope to uh, transcend the, the partisan divide that we currently are living in. Yeah, thanks. Lieutenant Governor, uh, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there were lots of issues that Governor Bashir and former Governor Devin disagreed on. Most of those were discussed, I actually thought fairly, uh, you know, in a cool, objective manner. Then you'd come to education and people got really mad, and really angry and ad hominem attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you and I have talked and I, I love the fact that your voice cuts through all of that mess and you do, as the commissioner talked about, talk about kids. So uh, should we be pessimistic? This is going to get worse before it gets better because it's a political strategy. Or there are ways that we can uh, bring the Commonwealth together on common agenda items. What, what's your perspective on this divide that seems to animate every time we talk about schools? Right. Well, and I, I agree with, with the commissioner that, that education is an issue that, that transcends um, all of the other challenges that we face. And, and I think we all share in, in this belief that for all of the challenges that we face here in Kentucky, education is the solution. Um, if it's not the whole solution, it's part of it, right? And um, it can't be unless we are committed to, as you say, put our kids first. And so that American dream and, and, the, and the process that, that our kids go through to get there um, is, is really critical and has nothing to do with what party in a, any of us belong to. And, you know, in politics, you have misinformation, you have, you know, you have muddied waters intentionally or unintentionally, but the bottom line is this. Do you want our kids, do you want your kids to have the best opportunity that they can have? 
If the answer is yes, then we have got to stop turning everything on its head just to be against the person across the table from us, right? And so uh, I think one of the ways that we can um, maybe get back to uh, common ground here is to acknowledge that education is the foundation of our economy. I mean, I always say the future of our economy is in our classrooms today. And so if you, even if you don't understand education, right, uh, if you don't, if you've never walked in those shoes or, or, or been in those trenches, you can understand that a healthy, uh, prepared, educated, skilled workforce will bring in new businesses, will help businesses expand, will make for an effective, efficient economy. And that's really what we're all working towards. But it's not about numbers. This is not a numbers business. This is a people business. And so even if the goal at the end of the day is to have a have a vibrant economy, your economy can only be as vibrant as your people. And that starts with our littlest learners and every opportunity we miss along the way because we're too busy trying to prove the other side wrong is a missed opportunity for an entire generation of kids. That's what's at stake. And we've got to, the, everything else is petty and nothing else matters, in, in my opinion. Uh, and, and we've got to get back to a place where we can have that at the center of the conversation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, the person who leads our work in early childhood and K-12 is Dr. Kish Kuni Price. And, and we're so happy that Kish uh, is part of the discussion today. So uh, her worry was, uh, Commissioner, that I was going to ask every question, and she's reached over and kicked me under the table. So, <laughs> so Kish, I think I'm supposed to kick to you for a couple of questions, and Absolutely. I'll jump in as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, I think I want to start with what you just left off with, the, the marriage of education and economic development in Kentucky. What do you see as kind of, I guess, your vision for what that looks like in Kentucky, and how can we get there? So it, it has to be a, a I'm going to use the word, it has to be a continuum. And, and uh, Commissioner Glass, President Thompson at CPE and myself uh, have come together and put a, 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 the Commonwealth Education Continuum together. And it starts with um, um, early childhood education and goes through the workforce. And our goal was to look at the different transition points in a kid's life you know, the, the transition point from uh, preschool or being at home to kindergarten. I mean, how many kids do we have that are kindergarten ready? Well, guess what? It's about the same number of kids that we have that graduate high school transition ready. And so what that tells us is if you start behind the eight ball, it's oftentimes really hard to catch you up. And so um, that focus on beginning beginning at the beginning mm -hmm. <laughs> and following our kids even after they walk across the stage and get that diploma and, and enter the real world that our work doesn't end right yeah. and so it really is about building out that continuum and so um, we've developed through that um, some some goals around um, recruiting uh, a more diverse uh, universe of educators mm -hmm. so that our kids can see themselves in the first leaders they experience outside of their home, right? Every kid deserves that. Uh, we worked on um, <coughs> ex uh, expanding dual credit opportunities for our kids so that they can, you know, have as much experience and access to college credit as possible mm -hmm. before they graduate. And then also uh, the third component of that is that transition from that really critical post-secondary transition that, let's face it, should look different for every kid. Mm -hmm. There's no one right answer for anybody, mm -hmm. especially with all of the different avenues that there are to, to access uh, these days. And so the governor and I both say, we don't have enough of anything. So if the workforce is your niche, if a post-secondary credential is your niche, if an apprenticeship is, if a four-year college degree is, great. Mm -hmm. Let's create those opportunities and let our kids find their way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not our job to tell them this is what you should do, right? right. Um, and so it really is about creating that opportunity. And that can only come if the entire education community is singing from the same sheet of music. And I think for the first time in a long time, thanks to um, President Thompson and Commissioner Glass and, and our community of educators that are in these positions right now, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to do that. Yeah. I sense that synergy. So that does bring some excitement. Good. There. <laughs> Good. Yes, 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 it does. And I'm wondering from your perspective, do you think that there are 
elements that haven't been addressed that we would need to prioritize in order to get there? Well, I uh, share uh, Lieutenant Governor's um, thoughts around the importance of uh, approaching uh, a education as an economic development tool with an eye toward uh, how we create a diverse economy. Uh, mm -hmm. We need all sorts of jobs mm -hmm. and we need preparation avenues in our um, uh, K-12 system and, uh, uh, and in our uh, career technical education system, in our um, colleges and universities, including our uh, community colleges mm -hmm. and, and our career technical colleges, uh, that there should be a variety of different pathways and options available uh, for students. So mm -hmm. I think the more that we can recognize that all of these are really important, uh, mm -hmm. that we need uh, doctors and lawyers and, and we need uh, teachers and we need architects and we need engineers and we need professionals and, and we need uh, skilled laborers and workers uh, mm -hmm. and, and we need entry level jobs. There's a right. continuum that makes our economy go and all of these jobs are really essential and important and so um, the, the education system must, um, I, I think, support our students in identifying what are their talents. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us um, end up in fields that we where we practice our professional lives uh, in areas where we had some skill or we had an interest of something that we were good at. Um, and so identifying those strengths that our students have and then supporting them on the pathway that, that they choose, I think, is, is the work of our K-12 system. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I do wonder with this upcoming year, you know, that urge to return to nor normalcy and testing and assessments like that was one of the the norms right <laughs> and getting to that model that you're talking about really tapping into a student's interest and understanding what they would like to pursue and helping them to do that we have to create space and place for that to happen so i'm wondering if you have and i know you have you know extensive experience as an educator and a coach how to build those relationships do you have any recommendations for what that could look like this year so I think one of the biggest things that the education community has acknowledged over the years, and, I, and you know, obviously the pandemic created its own set of challenges, but it exacerbated old ones. Mm -hmm. And one of those ones that we've been screaming about <laughs> is um, making sure that we teach and love the whole child, mm -hmm. right? And so and the commissioner alluded to a minute ago, it's about relationships. And, and so many of us, when we're asked about who our favorite teacher was growing up, it was the one that we felt connected with for one reason or another, mm -hmm. right? We just right. got that person. And making sure that this experience that we give our kids, this mm -hmm. learning experience that we give our kids is not just about, um, getting the right answer or being right the first time or circling the right answer on a standardized test, mm -hmm. right? Like all of that is very, very minuscule in, in the big picture. And we've got, to, we've, I think we've got to scan out back to that big picture. because It's like you said, <clears throat> some of us are eager to return back to normal, but I'll tell you this, if we miss this opportunity to decide what's not worth going back to, as much as we decide what, what we are, you know, uh, anxious to return to, we will have missed probably the opportunity of a lifetime. And being with being in a situation where we can support the mental and emotional health of our kids and, you know, create that, that place where they are safe and they know that they are loved and taken care of and that they are working towards a brighter future and they buy into that man mm -hmm. like that is the formula yeah. and it's never just about what's in that textbook right, right? that's yeah. certainly a, a foundational component of it mm -hmm. but that whole child mental social emotional health relationship building connecting um there's a quote <laughs> that um and i wish i could remember her name but I heard it from Brene Brown, so you know it's the gospel. It's um, the the jobs of the past were about muscle. The jobs of the present are about the brain. The jobs of the future will be about the heart. Mm -hmm. And so we've got that connection is really really important. Mm -hmm. um, and the students says say so right like that connection they had during the pandemic that was different than before with the with the teachers because they had to be so much more organized and and flexible and those types of things that's what they long for right yeah. and yeah. so again that you know it, it's 
it's multifaceted mm -hmm. and and uh, it, it ultimately is what our kids need and want mm -hmm. and we got to figure out how to make it happen absolutely agreed and I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective um, I know all of the school districts had to submit trauma-informed care plans to their um, local uh, school boards and um, if, if we're thinking about those elements of what the norm was but then understanding we're trying to move into this new space what would you recommend in terms of that balance because I, I would think as an educator going back into this year um, that's that's a lot <laughs> you know a lot to balance especially when <clears throat> many of our educators have been highly traumatized as well right so right. I, I think it's an excellent uh, question a lot of our conversation makes me reflect on wh what is the purpose of public education why are mm -hmm. we doing this mm -hmm. um, the Fordham Institute published a study um, gosh almost 10 years ago now that I thought was really uh, interesting and, and uh, maybe overlooked but it, they surveyed parents around the country uh, around uh, what what in your mind is the purpose of public education mm -hmm. and so from that um, one of the top ones was that the purpose of public education is for workforce development mm -hmm. which we've talked about uh, another one that came up uh, that the testing is related to is the purpose of public ed education is for academic um, progress or development right and that's mm -hmm. why we have all the tests because that's mm -hmm. emphasizing that component but other elements that came up were it's important to have a public education system that develops uh, citizens to participate in our democratic republic. Uh, it, it's in, uh, a purpose of, of public education is for uh, people of different uh, viewpoints and backgrounds to interact with each other so we learn to be diverse and tolerant and respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, another viewpoint was that the purpose of public education was to create well-rounded human beings who could appreciate art and beauty and, and life. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to argue with any of those. <laughs> right. Uh, right. They're all really <laughs> hard to do them all. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but so sometimes I think we, we get caught in these um, uh, frameworks where we overemphasize one element to that. So the whole uh, past two decades where we pursued uh, testing and punishment and testing on a really narrow set of skills in a very precise way that's all around basic content uh, is the emphasis on uh, the academic element of education or that purpose of education. Mm -hmm. Now we seem to be coming back here around and saying, well, there's an economic development aspect that we also need to be attending to. And then mm -hmm. through this pandemic, we recognize there's a human aspect of yeah. this that we, we need. Yeah. So I, I think the, there's this notion of balance, right? And we mm -hmm. have to find what is the right balance mm -hmm. of these things. And when we uh, pursue uh, uh, policies uh, that imbalance us for too long, we, we then turn back and say, well, we missed that or we lost that component or this is really important as well. Mm -hmm. So it, emerging from the pandemic, uh, things that, that I keep emphasizing with our educators is right now, we were gonna get to all of these things, mm -hmm. the, the, the academics, the testing, the uh, workforce development, but right now um, it's care before content. So mm -hmm. we need to find out uh, where, what, uh, experiences uh, have our kids had uh, if they're negative we need to attend to that and make mm -hmm. sure that they feel supported um, and understand that uh, any, any trauma that, that, that they've gone through and how we support students through that so care before content relationships before rigor mm -hmm. um, our, our kids even though they had some in-person learning last year that they had a, a few months of that and then we went away for summer kudos to our school uh, schools for operating uh, robust summer programs all yeah. across the state. Yes. I think that's, yes. that's a, a great step. Uh, but we've got to reestablish those relationships. And that's one of those things that our uh, students told us that they really thought was missing and important that we reestablish mm -hmm. quickly. So relationships before rigor. And then finally, because as educators and as policy wonks, we can, we can jump in and we can MTSS, RTI, uh, intervene, <laughs> like we can come up with really complex systems for how we think this is all going to work. Uh, I would say experience before expertise. And by that, I mean, concentrate on what the student is experiencing and think about how can we make that experience meaningful, authentic, mm -hmm. important to that student. Um, uh, and if we, if we put our emphasis there, and I just imagine as, as an, an education reform effort going forward, if we, if we look back, for maybe the past 30 years, we focus a lot on um, identifying what needs to be taught and then testing that and coming up with systems of rating that and consequences associated with that's That's been our agenda for the past. What if for the next 30 years, we're really concentrated on what is the student experiencing 
And does that experience of that student prepare them for the complex world that is to come? Mm -hmm. How much progress will we make? And how rich could we and vibrant could we make education for every child if that was our focus? Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah. if it's if it's appropriate to say amen, Brother Glass, uh, <laughs> I, would, I would say that. I was going to uh, say amen. So, so, uh, so uh, care before content. Uh, let me. I was was really surprised and very very disappointed in the Biden administration's decision to impose high stakes accountability and assessment last spring. Uh, I think, given the uh, wrong headed federal mandate, uh, you all did a, a good job of softening that as much as you could. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm curious uh, where you uh, and Lieutenant Governor, where you think accountability and assessment should go. Again, that, that bifurcation question we ask, instead of talking about what's wrong, I'd be happy to do that uh, with uh, high stakes uh, accountability. I'm curious what we'd like to see. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I'm old and decrepit. So I remember when CARA started, we had phrases like portfolios, uh, authentic assessment, performance events. Uh, my sense is that, that to this day, uh, three years ago as an assistant principal, y'all had to figure out how we beat the test game and then say, okay, now what do we really need to do for kids? Well, that's, that's a terrible way for a teacher or principal to live is to feel like that your metric is a have to, and then you got to get to the real business at hand. So I, I know you're, you are a, a, a really smart guy uh, on assessment accountability. Uh, as we rebuild, because I do think this gives us an opportunity to rebuild, uh, what should accountability and assessment look like, Commissioner? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate you raising um, some of the foundational concepts that were uh, built into CARA and the idea behind that, because it, it was a focus on changing student experience, some governance changes for sure, some, some finance uh, structure changes as well. But at the heart of it, it was really an effort Absolutely. to change the student experience. Absolutely. And then it ran headlong into all of the logistical problems with collecting all that information in the uh, in 1990s. Uh, and collecting all that together, man. What do you do with those portfolio right, scores? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, headlong into No Child Left Behind, which really prescribed a very narrow view of assessment and what the purpose of school was. Uh, so things have kind of come undone uh, with elements of care related to the, the student experience along the way. Uh, but I think there was wisdom uh, in, in that effort. Uh, and where we are now is we have electronic systems that make the uh, collection of data and information and evidence, um, the analysis, the scoring of that, the management of all that, much different. It, we're in a much different world than we were in, in the 19, early 1990s trying to do that. So that's, uh, that's I think, an opening and an opportunity. Uh, a second one is, and, and I, I was critical of the Biden administration's decision around uh, testing this year and, and made that known, but uh, we, we made it work and we asked our educators and students in the state to make it work and they did, they rose uh, to the challenge. But but uh, I do think that there is a willingness um, in the Biden administration to explore different assessment frameworks and models. Uh, we've seen that happen with uh, New Hampshire has a performance-based uh, assessment uh, model. We have an effort underway in Kentucky that we started in the middle of this pandemic to empower uh, a, a, about two dozen local communities, local school districts to come together and work on pilot uh, new assessments that were more authentic, that were more connected to the kinds of skills our students will need going forward. And I think that forms the beginning of what a, a, uh, a new generation of assessment and accountability could look like. If we go back to all these different purposes of public education, again, we've really been testing just one, academic knowledge, right? And that's, that is important. And we don't want to shy away from that. But we also recognize that there are all of these other elements that we think are really important to developing a successful, thriving human being. And can we bring some of those things into the accountability center and uh, system some and lift them up as equally important? Great. Like I said, I, I love the fact that just three years ago, you all were trying to figure out, do we emphasize on-demand writing or mm -hmm. portfolios mm -hmm. or whatever? Uh, so as Lieutenant Governor, as Secretary of Education, Cabinet, uh, as an educator, but, but maybe most importantly as a mom, uh, what, what do you think 
the assessment and accountability? What, what do you want for your own kids? Uh, what do you want to know as a mom? Uh, and what do you want to know as Lieutenant Governor about accountability and assessment? Yeah. So uh, first, let me start by saying, you know, we, we talk about how we um, need to put politics aside and do what's best for kids. Like you, I share a, an immense disdain for the decision that was made last spring uh, to continue forward with the standardized testing. And so much so, I spoke to Commissioner about this at length at the time, that I personally reached out to Secretary Cardona and asked that he reconsider that uh, because I felt so strongly about uh, knowing that we had X many days in, with our kids in person, what did we really need to be doing with them? Were we wasting those right. days? And so my, and my point to him was, you know, they, the, the argument for it, which, you know, you can see both sides of the <coughs> argument, but um, was that, you know, we needed data to do this and this and this, and my response was data's for adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so if we're only doing things in education for adults, that's a that's a big problem. So in addition to that, I think we've set up a system in which it is convenient, more more if not convenient, uh, efficient for adults. Right when we talk about a standardized test, that's easy to scan through a you know um, a machine and get a and get a score. It's not harder to score a performance assessment, right? It takes, it's subjective. It takes uh, sometimes a team of people um, and it takes time. And so uh, go back to the, to the very beginning, which is who are we doing this for? What is, what is best for our kids? And so if it means that it takes us more time and manpower to do, uh, to, to evaluate performance assessments um, and things of that nature than it does to take a, standardized test that we frame our whole year around, which is nuts, um, then, we need to, then we need to make the time for that. And so, you know, again, I think you have the, the people who are creating this policy based around what sounds good and what will produce the, quack, the, qu the quickest results versus the advice of the people who are doing the work and with the kids every day and know that this is not working. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to bring the folks in the trenches to the table and they need to help shape the future of assessment accountability in Kentucky because they're the ones doing the work. And what I hope it looks like, in addition to all the things that the commission just said is, I hope that this system of siloing subjects because it's convenient and, and more efficient for adults is broken down. I hope we look at really some cross-curricular really rich uh, project-based learning type experiences where kids are problem solving, collaborating and, and communicating those results because you mean, I, I, they can Google what, what years the Civil War happened, right? Um, understanding much more complex ideas around that and being able to relate it to today is what's important. That takes a lot of time mm -hmm. and a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And if that's what our educators need, let's give them the gift of time mm -hmm. because they got one shot at this with these yeah. kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and at the end of the day, that's, what's important. And so assessment and accountability doesn't always have to be something that you can quantify on a spreadsheet. It's, that's important. And there's a place for it. But at, at the end of the day, um, giving our kids the skills that they need, helping them build those, even the interpersonal skills uh, are going to serve them far longer mm -hmm. in the future and far better in the future than some standardized test score they got as an eighth grader. Yeah, great. Kish, yeah. Yeah, I, well, based on that question, um, with this huge infusion of funds that we're <laughs> receiving now, um, what, what are your recommendations on breaking down those silos so that we can effectively um, use those funds and um, kind of do this inner system exchange? Right. So one of the um, one of the I think benefits of that cross curricular uh, learning experience is that it really is more time efficient in terms of um, being able to utilize lots of different pieces of information and content areas uh, to get to an end goal. Right. So mm -hmm. one of the examples I can give you just real quickly is I taught sophomore government, and I went to the sophomore. English teachers and said, hey, let's work together on this. And you guys tell me the speeches that you're going to analyze. And um, 
and I'm going to figure out how to work that into what I'm doing. So I'll teach the content and the historical context and the, and the, you know, the, the politics behind it. And you can teach the literary uh, components of it. And in doing that, we were able to get so much more done, but it wasn't just about, um, you know, breadth of knowledge. It was about depth of knowledge too. Mm -hmm. And so that's one example of how teachers can, can collaborate and lead without any mandate or requirement. We just did that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so these influx of funds, and I know that the commissioner can talk a lot about, um, all of the opportunities that KDE is helping to create for our districts. Mm -hmm. One I'll speak to about the whole child is, uh, the governor <coughs> received 19 point, I think it was $4 million. <coughs> and year funding so mm -hmm. governor's discretionary funding can spend it however he wants mm -hmm. and so we sat down to figure out how we wanted to do that and my advice to him uh which he took <laughs> um was uh, such a smart guy he is he is he, he listens to me about education i appreciate that about him um and um so uh, i said listen we're, we're going to get uh, a lot of funding into the state for teaching and learning that is one one facet of this let's focus on the whole child too and so every dollar of that has gone towards uh mental emotional health services for kids and families uh early childhood opportunities mm -hmm. for families mm -hmm. who might be struggling in the workforce mm -hmm. uh, and then bridge programs where we kind of partner between uh 9 12 and um our college campuses because here's the kicker that we have so many kids who uh they missed out on being in a building <coughs> with um, guidance counselors yes. and they, the ones that have the least needed that the most. Mm -hmm. And so we, we created bridge programs from high school to college to help transition those kids in need, mm -hmm. wraparound services, support to get them there, but also to support them to keep them there mm -hmm. uh, because we know that that's something that they missed out on. And so everything from, resources and teaching and learning that I'm sure the, gov the, the governor, the commissioner can, you don't want to be governor again. Uh, the, <laughs> the commissioner can, can expand on, um, I, you know, it was really important to us to saddle up um, with the, the real mental health services that we can provide for our kids in need as well. And, and I think that's going to help to push it even further and take that um, progress even farther is our hope. So. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, I'm excited about what our schools will be able to do with these funds. So it's a really unprecedented infusion of federal dollars. We're likely to never see it again mm -hmm. in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can remember several times in my career getting frustrated when I would hear politicians say, well, you can't just throw money at education. And I would retort, I wish once. Well, now we have it right. happened. Right. Uh, we have, uh, there are some uh, limitations and, and time uh, limits on these funds. Mm -hmm. So they won't solve all of our problems uh, forever, but uh, they will be able to do some uh, wonderful things for students. We see districts thinking uh, first and foremost about how they can um, create meaningful experiences for students. Uh, so and that comes through the summer programs that we have it, uh, seen uh, in place now through uh, plans for extended day, extended year, um, weekend programs going uh, forward for the next uh, three years, all of which are efforts to sort of make up for the year that, that students had. Uh, so that's going to be a wonderful support uh, that, that uh, that students will have. We also see the expansion of, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, these community partnerships and connections with nonprofits, with uh, colleges and universities, with um, uh, other entities that are in communities. So with these nice partnerships that are creating experiences for students out in the community and, and outside of school, uh, and the expansion of uh, staff within buildings. So we're going to see more teachers. Uh, our, our schools are struggling to find people to fill all those roles because uh, we're seeing a decline in the number of people entering the teaching profession at the same time now we're posting a lot of jobs mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a struggle but we'll, we'll work our way through that but it's going to mean that there's going to be more support in schools uh, for students um, next year and for the next three years going forward so that's that's a major focus of these funds is creating meaningful experiences for and supports for students mm -hmm. a second major area where these funds are being expended is sort of enhancing and replenishing technology if we had chromebooks uh in districts they were they experienced more than just one year of use uh, over this past year mm -hmm. so the replenishment of that making sure that um, uh, districts 
uh, have quality uh, systems in place for all of the tech that now we're now relying on a lot more than we we did before. That's a major expense. Uh, and we we see districts that are considering uh, infrastructure facility upgrades, particularly related to ventilation systems, heating and cooling systems, that um, to to make them. Um, uh, able to move air and filter air in different ways than we could before. Uh, that was one of the, the challenges that we had uh, going into COVID and people would say, well, uh, how can you get on an airplane but you can't go into a school? Well, airplane has a filtration system designed to remove viruses. Mm -hmm. Schools, many of our school buildings that, that are operating on uh, decades old ventilation systems can't push enough air through a big enough filter to do that. So those are some changes that we see taking place now. Um, so I, I think we will uh, at the end of this three years, I will mark our success as if our students are able to look back at the year we just had and say that was really terrible. That experience was really terrible. But what my state, what my community, what my school district, what my teachers did for me in those next three years, mm -hmm. those were the best three years of my life. Mm -hmm. And then that to me will be a great mark of success if we have students saying, saying that at the end of, of this uh, period coming forward. Yeah. Let me ask, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm really excited because occasionally we have uh, members of the press joining us. I know the headline's going to be that Commissioner Glass announced his candidacy and the lieutenant governor <laughs> <laughs> he would be the governor this year. So that's, I guess, really everything else is kind of secondary. I'm um, unelected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, I want to ask an aha question, and I want to ask two different aha questions. One of the things that that I worry about, and I can say this because I'm a Kentuckian and, you know, uh, I've changed zip codes maybe once or twice, but, but you know, I'm born, raised, and live here. Uh, you were born in Kentucky, but you got away, and then you came back. Uh, do you have some ahas when you think about Iowa or Colorado and Kentucky and how you saw Kentucky? What Anything you can bring to the table, and, and what's the aha that you had coming back to Kentucky? Well, I think it's uh, that experience is um, it has pros and cons. Um, so I did grow up in the state and my parents were educated, lifelong educators. They retired uh, teachers uh, in Kentucky. Uh, and we have a family that goes back generations here. So this is home for me. Uh, and it, it's a place that uh, gave me so many opportunities from a great public education experience uh, growing up in Mead County to a great university experience. You were a green way. It God, was a green way, right, right. Um, and a great university experience and my first uh, teaching job in, in Hazard. Those, those have all been incredible formative experiences. So I owe a lot of who um, the, the person that I grew up to be to my, all of the support that I had in Kentucky. Uh, I spent a great deal of my professional life in college. Colorado and in Iowa and working um, in, in a few other states in different capacities as well. So then coming back, I think it's been a, a benefit to have the comparative um, system experience so you can see how different things are done in different systems, uh, the, the ways different states or different districts approach problems um, that you can bring in. And sometimes that, that brings a, a fresh set of eyes or an innovative approach uh, in, into Kentucky. But also, um, I, I recommend recognize that I've, because I've been gone for this 20-year uh, period, it doesn't mean that nothing happened. A heck of a lot happened, and a heck of a lot of good things happened. Uh, and so it's, it's really important for me to also listen to the people who have been here like yourself and understand the context and what's the story and how did we get here and wherever we are, how do we move it forward? I, I think in, in uh, positions like the Lieutenant Governor and I have, um, we all have to recognize that a leadership job is a temporary job. All of us are temporary. And at some point, something's going to take you out. It may be old age or maybe <laughs> something else, but at some point you're not going to be in that role anymore. And so we have an obligation to do as much good and move things forward as fast and as far as we can with the time that we have. So that's how I approach this work. Mm -hmm. So Lieutenant Governor, uh, as you and I have talked, I fear I'm being redundant, but but I just love the idea that, that you were, again, supervising the cafeteria three years ago. Sure and now you're, you know, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to have had some ahas as to you thought you knew what schools were and now in this position you're like oh you know so what what's your what is it the v8 moment it's like oh i should have had a what which what's, what's the aha that that you've had uh, looking at schools thinking about education wow yeah it, it's been a it was a quick journey from uh bus duty to 
the lieutenant governor's office mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and through that time, you know, I had the I had the opportunity as a as a classroom teacher, as a basketball coach, as an assistant principal. Uh, to build relationships with kids on a daily basis um, through the vehicle of athletics or the vehicle of, of you know, government and history or discipline. And then the yeah, I was just going to say job. discipline mm -hmm. if yes, you were an assistant yes. principal. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and some of my favorite relationships came yeah, from that. Absolutely. Um, but the aha moment I think I have is I think about where where I found myself now and how working with people and getting to um, the best solution for the kids in Kentucky um, has become such a massive undertaking. I, and I, I'm a little, I'm a little surprised by that um, because uh, when you're in a school system, eat, no, nobody knows what your politics are um, unless you make them public. Um, and you really just are looking at, okay, this is the issue that we're having. This is the challenge we're facing with, with these kids. What can we do to make it better, right? It should be that simple. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, working in, in state government um, has proven to make that, that's not quite as easy as it should be. And so I think my aha moment is uh, the importance of continuing to center our kids, but not just in the realm of education, but also in the realm of policy. Mm -hmm. Having the, the um, student voice team or the superintendent or uh, commissioner's advisory council um, be the face and lead and speak um, for us to, uh, the importance of us empowering them uh, in, 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 you know, rooms full of people that can make the decisions that can change their life mm -hmm. uh, has become so much bigger mm -hmm. and so much more important. I'm so grateful. I mean, we lean on the student advisory uh, team for a lot. The governor and I are the first administration that placed a current student on mm -hmm. the State Board of Education for student voice. Mm -hmm. And so lifting up those voices, listening to them and, and making sure they, they, are heard, I think is even more important. Mm -hmm. um, but not just about what goes on in their classroom, but also what, what policy is created that affects them and will affect mm -hmm. their younger siblings from here on out. Those discussions have got to continue to build out too. And I think it's incumbent upon the education community to spearhead those opportunities for, for our kids because we're, we're their greatest advocates. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Kish, I don't know about you, but I think we blew it because time's up and we really need parts two and three. So yes. uh, as we conclude, just two or three things. First of all, I want to remind everybody that we appreciate the support of uh, Aetna Better Health. These forums would not be possible without their support. Secondly, I want to remind you that next week we have part two. So Heard from the commissioner and lieutenant governor. Next week, you're going to hear from uh, a teacher, a superintendent, and a parent. That that those voices are also really important. Uh, I am so appreciative again, commissioner, uh, of the way that you are leading uh, K-12 in this state. Uh, you bring uh, an animated, creative, and uh, very unique style of leadership, and uh, I appreciate it more than you know, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, too. you know I'm a big fan of yours, uh, Lieutenant Governor. And again, uh, every time I hear you, uh, I just love the fact that you bring both brain and heart, that uh, that quote about muscle yeah. and brain and heart. You, you so exemplify the brain and the heart part of that, maybe the muscle part too, but definitely the, the brain, <laughs> and, so uh, <laughs> brain and the brain and heart part. So thanks for joining Thank us. You. Thank all of you for joining us today. And we'll see you next week, 10 o'clock uh, for part two of the 21-22 school year. Thanks.